Adam, you got some good height on your hair today. That was a shitty intro. I'm just redoing that shit, bro. I was like... You're going to redo that? You think in editing we're going to let you get away with a redo? Want to make that paper? Want to make that now? This is the affiliate marketing show. Want to make that paper? Want to make that now? What's up, everybody? This is Josh coming to you with another episode of the Affiliate Marketing Show. Make sure to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date on all the industry news and latest trends. I'm from OfferVault.com, the industry's largest aggregator of networks and affiliate offers. Today, we have, once again, Adam Young, the CEO of Ringba, industry legend Harrison Gewurz, per usual, and our good buddy, John, the CEO and founder of AxeAd Capital, one of the industry's best and most visionary networks when it comes to all things paper call and lead gen. We're gonna jump right into it. The CFPB joins the FTC on negative option marketing and dark patterns in their new circular. So for those of you that are not familiar with negative option marketing, it's essentially an automatic renewal or a trial subscription that starts off free or might kick in with a charge um, unbeknownst to the user. I've actually had this happen to me recently and it was quite frustrating. I'm sure I'm not alone here, but uh, this news actually makes me pretty happy. Stop buying dick pills, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it was it was actually my temperature controlled mattress cover, Harrison, that you got me hip to. A year later I saw a hey, charge I didn't on recommend my recommend that brand. The one that no. I have does not rebuild my credit card. Well, long story short, I got refunded after a, a very lengthy back and forth, um, which made me think like, is it really worth it? And I'm sure it is for these companies to do these auto renewals and uh, negative option, if we want to call it that, because a lot of people probably don't notice it. So to me as a consumer, I like it. I actually just set up a, a new Amazon Prime account. I remember they used to do auto renewals, but I noticed specifically this time, it said something like your, your subscription is going to end on this date and you'll no longer have the benefits. So I don't know if that's directly tied into this announcement, but it seems a lot of companies are kind of getting hip to consumers continuously complaining about this negative option marketing and dark patterns. Uh, I want to go straight to you, John, as our guest. I'd love for you to lead us off on what your thoughts are on this. Do you feel like it's fair to the companies to have to basically adjust their renewal policies in order for the consumers to have uh, a fair shake when it comes to these auto subscriptions? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that there should be an easy way for people to get in touch with people. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than when you try to call a number and it goes disconnected or you have to jump through all these hoops just to just to talk to somebody. Um, you know, at the same time, though, the companies can also have, you know, a, a retention team on, on their end answering the phones, trying to keep them on, you know, whatever that product is longer. Um, you know, maybe offer some discounts, you know, do what they need to do to see why the person even wants to cancel to begin with. Um, you know, it should be a valuable data for them. If they knew like, okay, all these people are canceling because of X, then, you know, maybe we should make some changes there. Yeah, Adam, when it comes to Ringba, do you guys auto renew your clients? And, you know, the main thing from the new circular related to the uh, FTC was basically saying it needs to have clear disclosure, informed consent, and easy cancellation. I'm sure you guys do all of that, but has, has these auto renewals with you and your clients ever been an issue? Um, and what are you guys doing to kind of like, you know, make sure it's kosher in terms of your policies? We don't actually do free trials that convert into a negative option. And I think that's the differentiating factor, at least for us. We do do monthly fees. However, those fees are fully transparent and disclosed. And then the consumer or the business, because we generally only sell business to business, knows exactly what they're going to be paying on a monthly basis when they register. So we don't really have to get into the minutia of disclosure on a negative option because technically a monthly subscription service that doesn't have a trial isn't a negative option campaign. I think this refers specifically to any sort of products or services that have a free trial that then if you don't cancel, renew into a big monthly fee. 
And that's part of the problem is a lot of the companies don't do clear disclosure or to John's point, have a great call center that answers the phone and makes it easy for consumers to cancel. Even with our monthly fees, you can just simply log into your account and cancel the account or you can ping live chat on support. We don't argue with people if they want to cancel, they cancel. And um, but what I think the problem is related to the negative options is the people running these businesses don't realize that, to John's point, if they have a conversation with the consumer and ask them why they're canceling or what they could do better, they could actually improve their business or they could offer them a one-time discount on the product to keep the subscription or something of that nature. There's, there's a lot of really creative ways that you can make your customers happy and still run trial offers. But you know, to this this article, uh, it's very similar to another thing I saw today in um, one of the mastermind groups that I subscribed to. Someone posted about Coursera also having a uh, class action and an issue with their negative option campaigns. And their disclosures are crazy. They literally tell consumers multiple times on the checkout process, hey, here's how you cancel. Here's how um, we're going to bill you. Here's what the price is going to be. And they still ran into an issue. So. I, I don't know if negative option campaigns are really um, the way to go if someone's looking to do a subscription. I, I think you really um, you're really going to have to either obnoxiously disclose to the consumer that they're going to get rebuilt, or the consumer needs to really like the product or service enough that they just fully subscribe at the beginning without um, the trial, which kind of sucks because some trial programs are really good. Well, so. I'd like to jump in a little bit. So first and foremost, I'm reading this thing and this this kind of stood out to me, um, you know, that customers should be promised an immediate and no questions asked cancellation. And that should mean just that, not a high pressure negotiation, but there's no specifics there. So this is just the government throwing out suggestions without giving ironclad details, typical government regulator shit. But if I was them, I would just go and work with the payment providers. I would go enforce this on Visa and MasterCard as Visa and MasterCard have actually put huge effort into enforcing this and making it more compliant. I have certain things that rebuild. I might be butchering this a little bit, but the actual rules from Visa and MasterCard essentially require an email notification to the consumer 72 hours before the rebuild with with an option to cancel either a phone or a link um, there. I have a bunch of random stuff that gets rebuilt. I would say less than half of them actually properly disclose this rebuild. Like, like they don't send me a notification that's saying three days they're gonna bang my card for, you know, some supplements I'm buying or whatever. Dick pills, Josh, just kidding. Um, you know, <laughs> on, on the other side of it, I think that the government is too they're focused on enforcing this against merchants or advertisers and if they really want to stick it like visa and mastercard are the true largest beneficiaries of negative option marketing because what do rebills generate yes they generate credit card processing fees but they generate chargebacks too which are a huge 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 revenue generator like it's pure profit because you just hit the merchant with these fees they have to dispute it do a bunch of bullshit. And they still lose these, especially because a lot of the times the chargebacks initiated if they haven't even sent the product out, et cetera. So, you know, I, I get what they're trying to do. I completely agree on the consumer side that you should be able to cancel. You should be able to get a hold of someone. But first and foremost, I think this thing that talks about the promise of immediate and no questions asked cancellation should mean just that, not a high pressure negotiation. That's ridiculous because a merchant should have the option to save a sale. It's just typical business. When I take something into a small business and I want to return it, they also try to negotiate sometimes. Um, and I, you know, they haven't explicitly prohibited that, but they're frowning upon it. And I think that's just in bad taste. And if they actually well, want to do something, they gotta just pressure. go penalize. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how many? What what defines, it? Yeah, what defines a high pressure negotiation? Does that mean I literally can't ask a consumer, "Hey, why do you want to cancel?" and then offer them a bonus incentive to not cancel? Like. That's what's shit with these guidelines is they don't actually outline what someone can and cannot do. And so someone's going to go into it with good faith and then they're still going to get slapped. Yeah, exactly. And it, it leaves uncertainty and misunderstanding. And a long time ago, someone told me the law is just about how you interpret it. 
And when I read this, I interpret it as not giving me any details. And it makes me hard to interpret it, <laughs> you know? John, um, how much time is too much time to go back to the company and ask for a refund after an auto renewal? You know, in my case, just recently, I think I noticed it just maybe a week after it had actually hit my credit card. Um, is there any time frame? Like, obviously, if you come back months later, I think that's crazy. But in your I opinion, think, like, yeah, go ahead. I think, um, you know, some people, they might look at their statements once a month, right? So 30 days after the billing date, I think would be fair, you know? Uh, but people who come back, you know, two, three months down the line, I, I think it's just, it's, it's unreasonable. Um, you know, and I guess it depends when they got the product too, right? How, how long did it take to ship? If it had to be shipped, uh, things like that also come into play. Yeah. And do you guys over at Axad Capital have any type of negative option or auto renewal set up? And have you had or ever had any issues in terms of that with your clients? No, I mean, I, I have some subscriptions, but, you know, most of them are pretty easy to, to cancel. Um, you know, they're with big brand names. So, you know, there's no issues. But I, I've heard of horror stories. I don't think this uh, this is for your Amazon Prime subscription. This is for when I need to lose weight and I buy some Garcinia. <laughs> or when you have a small penis and you need to buy some dick pills, right? <laughs> it happens. Wow. Ouch. Okay, we're going for it. I'm going to get you back, Josh. Don't you worry. I'm reporting this to HR, Adam. That was me getting you <laughs> back, dude. What are you talking about? We'll see uh, what happens yeah, in editing. But, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens in editing. That, <laughs> that editor seems to love to make me look good every week. It's just a matter of time before I get fired. But I thought that was very interesting. It is Wednesday. Is that opposite day? Um, yes. It is hump day, actually. Uh, I also saw that the FCC just released some information that may have really had a detrimental effect on phone burner. We actually got this from our buddy Eric Troutman over at tcpaworld.com. But essentially a lot of robocalls were made by phone burner, people asking, people that were on the DNC and that asked them not to call back. They did get called back. Um, it basically puts phone burner in a bad light, even if they have legitimate traffic. Adam, I know you have a lot of knowledge on this topic. I'd love for you to kind of lead us off here and give us your thoughts on what's going on. <laughs> yeah, so this reads like a shit show. Unfortunately for phone burner, the FCC put out guidance to telecom carriers to no longer carry uh, what they have deemed illegal robocalls. And those illegal robocalls um, are allegedly from MV Realty, and they did 11 million illegal robocalls to people who had opted out on the national do not call list, and they did those robocalls without consent, which is a, a big no-no. And so the FCC put out guidance that carriers should not be carrying phone burners traffic. Uh, that's illegal. And I think that's fair guidance, right? Like to tell carriers don't carry illegal traffic, that makes sense. However, uh, what actually happened is uh, when the FCC put out guidance like that without actually contacting phone burner first, which what I, I think is what happened, they just put out this public notice and didn't reach out to phone burner first. And so all of phone burners carriers just decided to pull the plug on them, um, which wasn't what the FCC's guidance was. The FCC's guidance just said, hey, so don't carry illegal robocalls. But I think part of the problem is when the FCC puts out guidance like that, it's very hard for the underlying carriers to understand what traffic is good and what traffic is bad. So in the face of a regulatory action, they just literally cut off all of phone burners traffic, like all of it. And so all the carriers had this knee jerk reaction and they basically took down all of phone burners business um, without even talking to them first and so phone burner you know their status page uh was an absolute nightmare um and it, it seems to have taken all of their platform down now i do think they worked with their carriers and they sort of resolved some of the issues and uh the article says that uh phone burner did uh retain legal counsel that specializes in this type of thing and reach out and reached out to the ftc to or excuse me fcc to hopefully resolve it but i think the reality 
of this is that when government regulatory bodies do not, just like we talked about, provide very explicit guidance and have open communications with the industries that they're attempting to regulate, you get a lot of knee-jerk reactions, which in effect most likely harmed millions of consumers. So when phone burner went down, all of the calls that were perfectly fine that did not get connected um, negatively impacted likely a significant volume of consumers and businesses. And so, you know, on one side of the coin, they're trying to protect consumers and businesses from bad behavior, but knee-jerk reactions like this actually sometimes cause more damage than they were meant to protect. And so um, this just, like, both of these articles and regulatory bodies just seem to be, like, not providing clear guidance, not communicating effectively, not getting their message out right. And then in the end, it actually causes damage uh, to businesses and consumers because their implementation process is just not clear. So um, sucks for phone burner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how many of these lawmakers really understand the industry and, and the complexities of it? You know, that's I don't I don't think many of them understand. They don't and they don't ask the people who do for advice or for they don't ask questions they just assume oh everything and then fuck shit up and it's really crazy um you know i i don't even have, like just to read this article like, holy shit, the trigger before aiming it's like uh makes no sense how do people get continuously called once they're placed on a dnc like what's the point of a do not call list if you're still getting calls especially from these robo calls and then even furthermore you're already on the list and you're asking not to be called back john what's uh what's your opinion of the dnc and does it actually work yeah i mean yeah yeah we have an internal dnc and you know on, on in this article it, it's it looks like you know the consumers were asking to be put on the dnc However, the advertiser wasn't actually doing it, um, you know, which is just insane. You know, you, the last thing you want is people screaming. Um, so, you know, we have an internal DNC list and then we use tools like, um, you know, Blacklist Alliance and things to scrub out, um, you know, those calls if they do come in. Yeah. Um, Adam, do not call list. What's your experience and how does it connect to Ringba? Well, we generally only handle inbound calls. We're an inbound call tracking platform, so we don't have a dialer built in or any outbound dialing technology. But there's really two scenarios, Josh. You have uh, a DNC list that's internal, like John's describing, where he he collects consumers who are not interested in receiving his message anymore, and then he removes them or blocks them from his list so they don't receive the message anymore, which is how you're supposed to do it. That's the correct way um, to run your business. And then there's the national do not call list, which is the national DNC. And that's a, a federally collected amount uh, list of phone numbers of people who just don't want any marketing calls at all. And so most people are not scrubbing their entire list for the federal, do, the national do not call list because that list is so voluminous it's so big it will just strip all of your potential customers out of your list before you dial on it and so your return on investment when you buy leads for instance is not going to be great and so most people when they buy a lead or most businesses when they buy a lead um, try to make sure uh, you know for the most part i think companies try to do a good job um, of making sure they have consent from consumers to contact them. And so if you have consent, explicit consent from a consumer, you can call them even if they're on the national do not call list because they provided explicit consent for you to call. Um, and so that gets a little dicey if you're buying data and you don't know the quality of the data or really where the data is collected. For instance, if you're going through uh, data brokers or offshore data vendors, it's really hard to validate if that data um, has legitimate consent with it. And that's where people get into problems, because if you're dialing data that doesn't have legitimate consumer uh, consent, you're going to run into TCPA issues and you can run into DNC issues, because if you didn't get the consent and they're on the DNC, you're technically in violation. Um, 
And so data quality is really important uh, to protect yourself and make sure that you're not calling consumers without their consent. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. hundred percent. You know, I actually saw a uh, phone burner came out with a response pretty quickly after this notice. I thought it'd be interesting to just read a few parts of it um, to yeah, kind of get a take of where they're coming from. But in the words of phone burner and their response to this on Tuesday afternoon, our company was made aware of a public notice posted by the FCC to all US based voice providers. As part of that notice phone burner was listed as one of the service providers for a company placing alleged illegal calls. The notice was clear that calls originating from our platform by the customer named in the notice were to be suspended within a prescribed timeline. We had no advance notice of this public notice and to our knowledge, neither did our carrier partners. If you have, if, as you have experienced, some of our carrier partners have interpreted the public notice to include all phone burner traffic. In our opinion, this clearly was not the intent of the public notice by the FCC. We are working aggressively to get our service restored and there are a few material updates to provide to you. So then they go on to talk about their legal counsel and how they're handling it. Um, in my opinion, it kind of sounds like they're just saying like we were unaware of what's going on um, and like kind of let the process play out. Harrison, what's your take on on where phone burners at at the moment and how they're handling it? Well, first and foremost, completely irrelevant, but I've heard of phone burner, but the first thing I thought of was a spoof card when I heard the name phone burner, which if you've been around the internet for a long time, you remember spoof card. The internet was a little more fun back then. But um, I, I think they should be considering suing the FCC for this. I mean, this is very inappropriate action. And I think the way they did it was just blatantly inappropriate um, and negligent and sloppy. Um, yeah. Because as Adam said, this harmed consumers. This platform is, you know, a phone system. People, like, I'm looking at their website. They have, like, Remax and Physicians Mutual as a client, AM and Healthcare. Like, these are huge companies. Like, people call or are being called to confirm appointments to doctor's appointments or surgeries. Like, to just pull the trigger like that and to do it in such a way that caused multiple carriers to take such aggressive action is I would, I think they should get a check as crazy as it may sound. I might be naive, but that's a big fuck up. I, I don't know what you think, Adam, but that that's where I'm at. I'm like, I, it says they retain the counsel. FCC, I mean, if you listen to what Josh said in, in their response, they literally are like, we found out from a customer who told us about this. I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. The FCC in my opinion, even if they were going to put out the notice, should have given phone burner some period of time to either resolve the issue or communicate to their customer base that they expected that a problem was going to happen so that no further exactly. consumers or businesses were harmed. I believe, and I don't know the phone burner folks, but I'm just going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I believe that if the FCC would have reached out to phone burner, maybe they did and we don't know it, but based on from what I can tell, they didn't, right? And so if the FCC didn't reach out to phone burner, they should have. And then I bet you phone burner would have done something about the problem before the public notice went out, probably would have communicated with their carrier partners, probably would have even forwarded the notice to the carrier partners and put a plan in place. The FCC could have asked them stating like, hey, guys, you got a real problem. You have 48 hours to tell us what you're going to do about it, what your plan's going to be. And then we're going to send out this public notice. They could have given phone burner enough time to manage the problem, to communicate it appropriately, and to not cause any other issues in the ecosystem. And so I think John is absolutely right. They don't talk to people in these industries to understand what's going on. And the government uh, is not doing a great job in this instance of communicating appropriately so more consumers and businesses aren't harmed by their action. Because they have to know if they put out a public notice like this that the carriers are just going to freak out uh, because they don't want regulatory action against them, right? And so they have these knee-jerk reactions. So I, I agree, Harrison. I also agree with the government. I think the government should proactively communicate and stop these types of problems but I just think there's probably a better way to do it so that other people aren't negatively affected. 
Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. Go ahead, John. What were you going to say? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I mean, the service was restored, but, you know, at, at what cost? You know, um, you know, the damage that the regulators have done without any due process is just, um, you know, it's just not fair. You know, it's not There's fair. There's real happen. brand brand damage too. clients right. lost money. Their brand is I'm not, you know, this is my own opinion. Don't get your own legal advice. Don't sue me. But like that's a, that's like majorly hard to fix overnight that that causes ma millions of dollars in brand equity damage, in my opinion. Yeah, they got burned. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Zinger from Adam. <laughs> John Quite said that their customers lost a ton of money too. And so it's important to realize that in sales call scenarios that a phone call is not worth a few cents. It can be worth $10, $50, $100 a call, $1,000 a call. And so if all the calls just shut down and phone burner is your service provider, it could have caused millions, tens of millions, who knows, maybe even $100 million worth of damage. We, we can never be able, uh, we will never be able to figure it out. But when those phone lines drop, um, all those businesses just have to eat it. And there's no recourse whatsoever. Um, and as someone in telecom, you know, I've been through this before when a telecom company has an issue, uh, like we've had major telecom companies have their entire toll-free network go down. Um, and then our customers are super, super upset about it, even though we have no control over it. But it still sucks. It sucks for the the consumers of their platform, and they literally have no recourse. And so I think Harrison's right. I think if I were phone burner, I would be asking a lot of questions to the government, and uh, I would be considering my options because they caused them a They will lose damage. customers. They have lost customers over this, and they will lose more. Um. And it was at the fault of someone pulling the trigger early, not communicating, not giving notice, and doing it in a, I'm being nice when I say this, a inappropriate manner, simply put. Assuming that all of this is true, right, Harrison? The one piece of information we don't have is if the FCC did reach out to phone burner and phone burner was like, uh, never mind, Go fuck or yourself. we don't care. Like, we don't and know, that's we possible. Don't know if that happens. It's possible. Um, you know, I'd love to give the government the benefit of the doubt, but from what I can tell, it it just doesn't seem like they went down that path. Yeah, I think this all sounds like it either. That's what I think. I agree. I think this all kind of ties into compliance, which seems to be a recurring theme on our podcast. You know, sometimes we like to ask our guests what they would like to talk about. John mentioned basically getting our compliance questions answered. And I think this kind of piggybacks off of what we were just talking about with phone burner. You know, for example, like, do we have a group like Consumer Council where we, were, where we can go to get our questions answered? So John, I wanna know, like, in your professional experience, what has your, um, your experience with compliance been? Have you ever had any issues with compliance and how does AxAd Capital basically handle their compliance policy? Number one, I just document everything, right? Keep keep good documentation of, you know, people who are giving you the advice if you're going to legal counsel, you know, make sure everything is documented. Um, and, you know, and if you're unsure, just um, kind of tread on the, the side of caution. I want to talk about AxAd Capital a little bit here. Um, why don't you give us a, like a very quick synopsis of exactly what you guys focus on? And then we can talk a little bit about the upcoming year, um, the upcoming election, what's hot, what you see is really taking off right now. So again, first, tell us a little bit about Accent Capital, what you guys do. Yes. Yeah, so first we run our own traffic. We do internal media buys through um, search, social display, uh, push pop, uh, whether it's for calls or CPL lead generation. Um, we focus heavily in, in the insurance space, auto insurance, health insurance, uh, life insurance. Uh, then we're also in finance, debt, uh, payday loans, personal loans, business loans. Uh, we also own uh, an insurance company, aerialquotes.com, um, where we can actually close policies internally uh, for health and life. Um, we also have a merchant cash advance company that we own where we can underwrite our own underwrite our own loans and, and lend money out. Um, business loans have, have been, you know, we, we see a, a big rise uh, in business loans uh, the, this year and, and at the latter part of uh, 2022. Um, and there's all tons of, you know, kind of cross sells that we can that we can put in there. 
Uh, for 2023, we're really starting to see a, a resurgence in, uh, in auto insurance, um, which is nice to see because last year, auto insurance budgets really took quite a hit. Uh, but, you know, we see some, some players getting back into the game. Um, Why do you think auto insurance took such a hit last year? Um, I think uh, premiums had to go up because during COVID, um, premiums went down so much, right? And then in, in 2022, premiums had to go back up. So anybody who had insurance and they wanted to save money, they, they weren't able to anymore. Um, I think that was one of the biggest factors. Also, Josh, when COVID ended and people started driving again, there were a lot more claims against these now lower insurance rates. And so their loss ratios got all screwed up. And so the first thing they did was pull back on the marketing budgets. But to John's point, we see a resurgence across our clients of auto insurance traffic. And so I think 2023, I don't know when, but I think 2023 is going to be a solid year for auto insurance advertising. I, I think it's going to come back in a big way. And then also, John, I, I have a question for you. So Ariel is one of my favorite people in the industry. Um, they went through my class, got started, and you guys uh, brought them on the team. And it's just been a pleasure uh, to work um, with your team and to see all of that personal growth. And so first, I want to give a shout out and kudos to Ariel. Um, I'm a big fan. And then also, I am curious. Uh, I love that you named it Ariel Quotes. Tell me more about that and kind of what your vision is for um, writing and binding your own uh, Medicare policies? Like, what's that journey going to look like? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're definitely not doing Medicare policies. We're only doing oh, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> under 64 and uh, life insurance. But yeah, no, we're, we're in the process of kind of just building out a, a team of closers. Um, you know, we, we know what traffic is running good. We, we see it by, you know, when we send it to our other buyers, you know, who's closing what. So it kind of became a no brainer to be like, okay, let's you know, close some of these internally, and then we can sell the overflow to, to our buyers. Um, so, you know, the, I guess the biggest hurdle we, we we're facing is really just finding um, licensed agents to, to answer those phone calls. Um, but, you know, we'll get there, you know, one, one agent at a time. Cool. So are you then looking at the demographics of your calls and essentially finding the calls you think will be the best fit for aerial quotes before you decide to sell the call to somebody else? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is uh, what state they're in. You know, we we mm. able to see which states have been converting best and then we get licensed in those states. Cool. And are all these uh, health agents, are they remote or are you guys running a physical call center? Yeah, we have uh, we have a few people in the office here, and then we also have uh, remote agents. Very cool. Very cool. I know Ariel is a big, big fan of the podcast as well. And I say that because sometimes we like to talk about books that were very influential in our lives. And I remember he sent us or they sent us a picture of many different books that we had discussed. Ariel, shout out to you. Thanks for being a fan. But to piggyback off of that, John, I want to know what kind of books are you into and in terms of, you know, people in the industry bettering their lives in the business world and in life in general, what are some of the most influential books you've read? We're kind of keeping a list of people and yeah. their suggestions that we're going to do something with later. I mean, I would say I have a few. Um, one of uh, a recent book that I, that I read was um, um, Good to Great by Jim Collins. That was What's it called? It's called Good to Great. Um, you know, it, it gives a couple different uh, kind of bullet points of, you know, leadership, level five leadership and um, just just different, really helpful ways to, you know, just stay humble and, and you know, to help other people grow. Um, another one that's not kind of really business related is more, I guess, uh, spiritual or, or philosophical is the Kabillion. Um, I don't know if you guys ever read that, but that, that's a pretty good book that kind of just outlines a bunch of principles that are, um, you know, that are just kind of laws of, uh, of the universe. And, you know, it, it, it puts things together of uh, manifesting reality and things of that nature. Yeah, I'm very into the spirituality stuff as well. I'm actually reading a book right now called You Are the Placebo. 
And it talks about how powerful our brains are and the concept of placebos and how people can cure disease just by thought alone. Adam, what are you reading right now? You are the placebo. And I, uh, well, I am Josh. (laughs) I am Josh Sebo, also known as Josh Placebo. Um, Oh, wow. (laughs) Um, I actually I knew that I was, was finished, coming. <laughs> I actually just finished Russell Brunson's book, Traffic Secrets, and I thought it was a, an interesting read as an old school media buyer, but I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, he actually does talk a lot about podcasting and how to generate traffic for your podcast in the book. So I felt it was appropriate and I read it and I'm already working on implementing some of those things so that we can continue to grow our audience. Now, the question is, is who are you going to hire as your host? We haven't well, found we the answer in a book. numerous applications. <laughs> I think you guys should just get ChatGPT to run this thing going forward. Probably would be a little bit more, uh, less hiccups along the way. John, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, we really appreciate you having us having you on and coming on. And I usually pass it back to our guests to talk about Axad Capital, but we just did that. But uh, what kind of what trade shows might we see you at in the upcoming year? Uh, definitely be at LeedsCon. I think that's coming up. Uh, Lead Generation World, all the affiliate summits. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm I'm usually at all of them. Awesome. Well, for Josh from OfferVault.com, John from Axad Capital, Adam, the amazing. CEO of Ringba and the industry legend Harrison Gavertz. Let's make that paper. Let's make that dough. This was the affiliate marketing show. We'll see you next week, everybody. Marketing show.